after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salutations, peace and blessings upon the best of creation, the jewel and crown of creation, the beloved of Allah Almighty, the coolness to our eyes, the purpose of our lives, the reviver of our hearts, the inspirer to our minds, the awakener of our souls, the most honored one, the most praised one, the most generous one, the most kind one, undoubtedly he is the most beautiful one. None other than Sayyiduna Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa barik wa sallam. We have just a few days left until the month of Shawal passes us, leaves us, and we enter into the month of Dhul Qa'da. And after Dhul Qa'da is the month of Hajj. Many brothers and sisters around the world are preparing themselves for the great pilgrimage, the Hajj, from wherever they live around the world to the Holy Land, the most blessed lands of Makkah Mukarramah, and thereafter ziyarah to visit the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Masjid al-Nabawi in Medina Munawwara. And with knowing this, we must also understand and make our intention that inshallah, Allah give us all tawfiq to go and perform hajj once in a lifetime. He who performs hajj without any uh, swearing, without any quarreling, without any arguing, which is common in during that time if you've ever been to the Haramain Sharifain for Umrah, there's a lot of hustle and bustle. There's a lot of people there. You know, there can be up to three and a half, four million people performing Hajj. And that's a lot of people, a lot of characters, a lot of personalities, a lot of different ethnicities, backgrounds, people of different um, cultures, all in this one place, of course, there's going to be to and fro's, there will be issues. Hence why the Prophet ﷺ specifically said that he who performs the Hajj and he does not, uh, no Rafath, no Fusuq, no swearing, no backbiting, no lying, no arguing, no quarreling, no shouting, then he shall return home with all his sins washed away just as a mother gives birth to a newborn child. We know that a, a mother giving birth to a child, that child is ma'asum. He's sinless. He enters this world with no sins uh, in his accounts, no, no problems, no issues. He doesn't come with a list of uh, sins that may he, maybe his parents committed. He doesn't inherit this. He doesn't receive this. He comes into this world ma'asum. He comes into this world sinless. And that's how a person will return home who does hajj, how hajj should be done. He'll return home with no sins to his name. Allah will forgive all of his sins. And that's the intention many a uh, brother and sister set out with when performing intending to perform the hajj that allah forgive our sins and that we uh, fulfill this obligation this fard hajj is fard once in a lifetime if you have the finances you have the physical ability 
If you have the physical ability, the finances, you are able physically, you are able financially, you are able spiritually and emotionally, then such a person would set out to perform, would make intention and perform his hajj. And this is how it should be. This is how it should be. The hajj is uh, once in a lifetime opportunity for many a people. And I don't know if many of you have researched and found out that the prices of hajj now this year is, is at least a, a basic package of around seven to eight thousand pounds. And those who want a bit extra, then it's around nine to ten, eleven thousand pounds. And I don't see prices falling. I don't see prices dropping. Um, and that's not because the people who are taking people to do hajj, they are, of course, making what they make on that. They may make 500 pounds to 1,000 to 1,500 pounds per, per client, per customer. And they are facilitating. They are organizing. They've got a job. That's a job in itself. Whether a jayiz banna ya ni banna, that's another question. But they are tour operators. That's their duty. That's what they've got the license for. They may have a hundred visas. And through those hundred visas, they'll sell them a package. So that will include hotels. They've organized and arranged the hotel. That will include transport. They've organized and arranged the transport. That includes airline tickets. They've organized and arranged the airline tickets with the airline companies. So it's a job. Somebody has to do this. If they're not going to do it, you would have to do it. And in the Hajj time, in the Hajj season, it's very difficult to find, get a visa unless you go with somebody who is accredited by the Ministry of Hajj. So those travel agents who are accredited, for example. So this is just a bit of insight into this. And then not only is it... Um, the prices have gone up. One of the reasons for that is what? One of the reasons for the prices uh, going up is the global inflation. The global cost of living has gone up. Many countries are going through difficulties. Look at us in this country. The price of fuel hasn't dropped. You know, it's going up to 183, 184, then it goes down. And we think maybe it's dropping and it's 179, 178 before it hits back up again. So the, the, the price of fuel, the price of uh, utilities at home, how much electricity, gas, water bills have gone up. You know, there's a sharp increase. And in October, it'll go up again. Even though the Chancellor of Exchange, he has uh, put 15 billion towards easing the cost of living in this country. I mean, it's still difficult. Very difficult. Those of you who are in the restaurant trade, those of you who know people who are in the restaurant and takeaway trade, oil is a big part of the fryers, a big part of the industry. A barrel of oil, how much now? 37, 38, 39, 40 pounds, some 45 pounds. I was talking to uh, major wholesalers who wholesale to businesses and they said that the profit margins are reducing. We are, there's not enough profit in this industry now as it once used to be. And that's just the global cost of living around the world, especially here in the United Kingdom. It's expensive now. Everything is, is, has gone increased, has increased, expensive. Everything has increased, but if we were to increase our fees at the madrasa, they would say, why are you increasing? And they would not understand that this is the cost of living as well. Yani, when it comes to religion, there shouldn't be no increase. But when it comes to the dunya, we'll happily say, yeah, we've got no choice. We can't live without fuel. We can't live without food. We can't live without oil. We can't live without these things. We need to live. But what about living without education? Those who provide education, those who teach. They have families to feed as well. They have houses to run as well. You know, they, then it's the perception, perception is that the one who is an imam or a maulana or a sheikh or a ustaz or a, a mudarris, a teacher, 
that he should be living the most simple life. He must be living the most, uh, you know, he needs to be living the, the quiet life. He shouldn't be living the high life or he shouldn't be living a comfortable life or, an, or a good life. He should be, because, you know, we said dunya sijnul mu'min, the dunya is a prison for the believer. If it's a prison for the believer, how does a prison live in, how does a prisoner live in a prison? He doesn't wear much flash clothes, he doesn't have much time. You know, we misinterpret and misunderstand the hadith. And we will use this hadith against the ulama, or we'll use other hadith against the ulama and say, oh, he can't live. Yet we fail to understand that during the Ottoman rule, when the Adawlatul Uthmaniya, the Ottoman Empire was ruling in the world. We live in the, the, the supposed free world now. We live in a world of capitalism and in a world of materialism. We live in a world of where it's dictated and run by the media and, and so, so on and so forth. In, in this, this is the modern world that we live in. But going part in, if you know history of Islam, Islamic history, you'll know that the Ottoman Empire collapsed in 1920s. Before then, for over 400 years, the Ottomans ruled throughout Europe. So countries like Albania, countries like Russia, countries like Bulgaria, countries, uh, you know, as far as Spain. I mean, Islam was in Spain for over 800 years. Tariq bin Ziyad went there. You know, there is so much Islamic history in Europe, but we don't get taught this. We don't know this. And during the golden age of Islamic history, when the Ottomans were ruling over the European countries and European land over this land, from as far as, Hatta, even if you was, we, we all credit, or historians, modern day historians credit, Christopher Columbus as the one who discovered America. But the truth and reality, it was a Turkish alim who was great at sailing over the seas, who actually drew, drew the first map of America, was a, a Turkish Muslim. From Istanbul, he set out. 200 years before Christopher Columbus, 300 years before Christopher Columbus. But the Western history tells you, oh no, it was Columbus who went and he sailed the seas till he arrived uh, in, in, in the new land, in the new world, which was discovered as supposedly as America. Islam had already reached there. So the Ottomans had a hand as far as the new world in America, South America, to Spain, all across Africa, Hatta even as far south as South Africa, they went all the way east towards China. The Ottoman Turks, they had control over these lands, they ruled over these lands. And who were the highest paid public servants? Who had the highest uh, wage as a professional in the, in the community? It was the Imam, the Mawlana, the Sheikh. He had the best, he was given the best house. He was given the best mode of transport at that time. He was given the best clothes to wear because this was the person who represented Islam. He must represent Islam the best. Yet today we say, Imam Sahib, to see you what you got to do. You to And this, and this. You know, we get it all the time. People don't say it to me, but we know people have these discussions. Hey, but Imam Sahib, bro. You know, flane Imam Sahib, flane Peer Sahib, flane he, flane ho. You know, if Allah Almighty has blessed them, given them, as long, of course, as long as they're not taking from the public's funds, if they are earning this, then they have every right to spend this how they will. We're happy to pay in terms of our, uh, as parents, we are happy to pay 20, how much is it for student, um, children's, uh, what do you call it? Not dinner money, not the dinner money. Dinner money is not that, it's about five pound, 10 pound. Fees. Not the fees uh, when they do the booster classes and what? tuition. How much, how much, how much, uh, you know, when you go send your child to do booster, GCSE boosters or A-level boosters or SATS booster classes, how much are they paying an hour? 
for tuition classes. How much? 20 or 30 pounds. An hour. One hour they'll pay 20, 30 pounds. They may say, I'll send my son maybe five hours this week, three hours this week. Yani we invest so much because we know if they get their SATs results, they'll get into good uh, uh, sets in their class for in secondary school. If they get good GCSE results, they'll have good, good opportunities to do A-levels. If they get good A-level results, they'll get to go into the degree that they wish. And then if they get a degree, they'll graduate. Sadiwi is it, Inadiwi is it, you know, very happy. Bande Dad, they say, Subhanallah, Mashallah, Tusan Putta, Dr. Sab, Banigya, Vakil, Banigya, Vagera, Vagera. We'll spend a lot of money on this. We'll spend a lot of money, but the priority and the question is, what about the deen? It comes back down to, well, how much are we investing into, the, into the, our children's Islamic education, the religious education, education of the deen, for example? How much are we investing? Uh, in, 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 re in respect to this, and, you know, then this is where we, we will um and ah and we'll say, no, this is not enough, this is not enough. Or this is too much. This is too much. And we must ask ourselves, what is priority then? For knowledge of the dunya is as far as the dunya. Becoming a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, becoming... Uh, whatever it may be in whichever field, which is a good thing. I'm not discouraging people to go out and seek knowledge. If becoming a doctor, you're saving lives. But look at how much Allah might, uh, look at how much we appreciate the services of a doctor that reflects in the wage that he receives. A doctor would be on what, 70, 80,000, a surgeon, maybe 100, 150,000. It reflects on the level he's saving people's lives. And a true alim of the deen, alim rabbani, he is saving people from the fire of Jahannam. He should be getting, getting double the amount that a doctor or a surgeon would receive. Why? Because not only is he saving that person's dunya, he, all, he is also saving that person's akhirah. Maybe he says one word that will guide a person and say, look, I heard his bayan, I heard his speech, and I've changed. I've started praying my salah. I went and sat in his company. And whilst in his company, I increased my iman and I maintained my salah. He encouraged me to go and perform hajj. I heard his bayan and I did. Yani, what, what, is the, what, what price can you give to someone who guides you into the deen? There is no price in reality. Allah is the one who will give ajr to that person, but the truth and reality is that we, we've got to understand and appreciate that those who are working within this field, the field of the deen, that what they deserve, what they are entitled to, should be equal if not more, as in the time of the Ottomans, should be equal if not more than those that uh, what, what we see people around. And this is very important to bear in mind uh, and, and very important to understand, we must change the mentality of people. The mentality of people, you know, I know many masjids, they will give the Imam Hafizah who does the Jamaat, they'll give him a hundred pound a week. Mentality is, twenty-four here, twenty-four there, twenty-four there. Like this, now they will be claiming benefits as well. That's what's happening. Instead, why can't we in our masajid have a wage structure? That we give our, our imams a fixed wage. That we will pay you, but then we demand, we expect the following. That you be on time for your prayers. That you lead the prayers. That you deliver the sermons. That we expect and we demand what? That you have to be there for the community. You must counsel the community. You must help the community. You must advise the community. You mustn't have any issues. You mustn't look over your shoulder. How am I going to put food on the table for my children? And unfortunately, if you ask and you see, the mentality is that no. No problem. But it shouldn't be like that. We shouldn't be like that. We must, we must uh, respect them. And when you pay someone for the ilm that they pass on 
or for the services. You are not paying for the ilm. There is no price to knowledge, brothers. You cannot say that I've taught you a verse of the Quran and that will cost you, for example, 300 pounds. There's no price of that. We don't charge. Example, we, we teach children Qaeda here. We start from the Alif Bata all the way up to Juz Amma. Nurani Qaeda, Ahsanul Qawaid, Juz Amma, from Juz Amma to the Quran. They recite the entire Quran to the Ustaz once, twice, and then they leave. Along with this, we teach them Sirah, we teach them Fiqh, we teach them Aqidah, we teach them all the sciences that every young Muslim should know. How to pray, what the kalimas are, what the duas are, when you wake up, when you go to sleep, etc. This is all part of the syllabus that we teach in our madrasa, for example. When we pay our teachers wages, minimum wage we pay them, according to government requirements. When we pay them the, the, their wage, are we paying them for the knowledge that they've given to the child? No. That is ajr between him and Allah. That's between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what are we? It's for the time that they're giving. End of day, next man or this teacher or stars or this female teacher has taken two and a half, three, four hours out to teach. We must pay them for that time that they've taken. Time is money, brothers. Time is money, space is money. That's the truth. Everywhere else, time is money. You call an electrician out just to come and see your work. He'll, he'll have a call out fee of 60 pounds. You call out an engineer, he'll have a call out fee. Yani, they all have call out fees, but when it comes to the deen, not, not saying that we have a call out fee, but it's like, you know, mm, you know why, why are we giving here? We shouldn't be giving, but you should be giving. These are the people that are teaching your children. They are teaching them how to read the Quran. They are taking time out. Find someone to give you time in today's day and age. You can't find it. So the, 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 the wage has to reflect. And we must understand, and why I'm mentioning this is, is because we must change our mentality, our mindset in regards to the matters of the deen. You know, if the, the izzat of the alim is the izzat of the deen. The izzat of the deen is through the izzat of the alim. And that's, that's very important. It reflects. And, and if you understand this, look, for example, you come, you pray your salah here. You make your intention to read behind me. You trust me, you read behind me, you make your niyyah. You know, we make intention to read two raka'ah fard, salatul jumu'ah, facing the qibla behind this imam. Peter is imam, say. Behind this imam and Allahu Akbar. You trust. If I make a mistake, in my prayer, I will do sajda to sahu. If I forget to do this, then this is responsibility between me and Allah. I will take the responsibility, not you. You are muqtadiyun, you are followers. That's why you have one to lead, not ten to lead. Only one person leads, not ten people leading. And, and when you have this, when you understand this, this uh, the position, and, and not everyone can stand there, not everyone can go and Lead the prayer. Not everyone understands uh, the ahkam of salah, ahkam of prayer, the ahkam of the deen. We've taken out years to study the deen. And we still study. We are still students of the deen. And we have people in within our communities who, oh, we know better than so-and-so, or I know better than so-and-so in these matters. It's like me walking into, say, the uh, garage and saying, no, 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 brother, you're doing it wrong with the gearbox. Or you're doing it wrong. I can't go and tell him in his profession how to do his job. Or me going to Shazad and saying, SM flooring, you've not done it. I can't tell him. It's like me going into a butcher's shop and saying, you didn't cut it right. That's not what I learn. That's not my profession. What I am good at, I am good at. What the awam and what you are good at in your profession, you are good at. A joiner is good at joinery. A plumber is good at plumbing. An engineer is good at engineering. A mechanic is good at mechanics, cars. So it's, it's understanding everyone has a role in society. Everyone has a position in society. Everyone has a job within society. Knowing your role, knowing your job, knowing your position, it's very important for us. And understanding then the role, position, and the job of the man who stands on the musalla, the imam, and I'm not talking about me here. I'm talking in general, whichever masjid you go to, whoever is standing on that musalla, we must understand that this person is the most learned in our 
in our locality, in our community. Hence why he is there and not nobody else. And you must give that respect. You must give that respect, give that adab. For he who does disrespects an alim of the deen, there's even a saying that has been said that he who disrespects an alim of the deen with intention of disrespecting him, that person is bordering on, the, on, on kufr. It's disrespectful. You should not do the toheen ihanatul alim. Yani alim ad-deeni toheen karna. To disrespect him, it's not acceptable. Because the, what is it that Allah has given him that he hasn't given to anyone else? Maybe it's the hifz of the Qur'an. Maybe it's ta'aleem al-Qur'an. Understanding of al-Qur'an al-Kareem. And it's very important that we, we, we keep this in mind and we change our mindset and mentalities. Our mentality is a bit old school. I mean, here in this masjid, we're okay. We have a lot of young people. We don't have no committee here. We don't have no Sadr Saab and Khazanchi and this and this. No, there's brothers, they come, they volunteer, they help, they assist. And we maintain and we run this masjid, alhamdulillah. We run this organization, this setup, and, and we continue and, and carry on with this. And it's very important that we, we try our utmost to, to create a future for our children that will benefit them. That's our job and our duty. As parents, as teachers, as ulama, as imams in positions of authority, in positions of responsibility, that we are creating the best possible future for our children. How do we create the best possible future for our children? Well, we have a madrasa system. We are always looking to improve. And that's the best way that we, we look to improve the madrasa system for our children that it creates the best possible future for them. And you mustn't neglect, we mustn't, every parent sitting here must not neglect and must not ignore uh, giving their children the best possible Islamic education, knowledge of the deen. This is the age to give them that knowledge. Otherwise, when they reach a certain age, look at how many young fathers who are sitting here, when they went to masjid and madrasa, they read the Quran. Then they got busy in the dunya. When we say busy in the dunya, busy with work, busy with the mortgage, busy with family, busy with children, busy with the wife, busy with friends, and, and we then slowly get away from the deen. And they say, oh, Imam Sahib, waqt hai si jala si Quran pardesa. We used to read Quran. You know, thora bot Quran aane. We can read a little bit because when we went to masjid back in the days, we read, but we forgot how to read the Quran now. Because there's no attachment. What we don't want is today's children who come to our madrasa, that they become in a position in 20 years from now, they say, I forgot how to read the Quran. You knew how to read the Quran, you just never kept up with reading the Quran. You went to a masjid, a madrasa, whether the Hafiz Sahib in that time, 30 years ago, he beat you up or he didn't, that was the, the, the way of that time. We don't do that here. That, that's what was happening then. And 30 years later, they beat you so bad that you forgot what you even knew. <laughs> Possibly that could be the reason. But you say, I forgot the Quran. I've, I, you know, I, I don't, I've not read the Quran in a long time. A lot of young, old, not old men, men in their 40s, 50s come here and they say, you know, I forgot how to read the Quran. Do you have any Quran class for adults where we can learn how to read the Quran again? Yani, alhamdulillah, they know how to read the Quran. They just need to revise. One, two, three, after 10, 15 lessons, it'll all come back, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He guides our children, protects our children. Allah guide us, Allah forgive us, shower mercy upon each and every one of us. Wa aqulu qawli hadha astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa akhru da'waya anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. La ilaha illa Allah, Allah, Allah. لا إله إلا الله جود عليه